Small World Lifters, today I'm here with, introduce yourself. I'm Dave Hoff. Hoff? Uh, yes, sir. West Side Barbell. So could you tell us, who was Dave Hoff before all the powerlifting thing? Before the powerlifting thing? Well, I've been powerlifting... Well, I was a high school kid playing high school football. That's about what I did. I played... I, I, before, before powerlifting, I did a lot of... Um, I played a lot of sports, primarily football. I started playing football probably when I was, I don't know, 10 or 11. We had, uh, here in America, we have Travel League football, or American football. And uh, I always played that, and then in high school, actually, it was probably around middle school when I was going into high school, there was a guy I was at a gym that I saw wearing a bench press shirt, and he was actually from here, and I talked to him, and he ended up bringing me here, so. Mm -hmm. um, I probably, this would be my, this would be my 17th year here, so. Yeah. There wasn't much before the powerlifter. I've been doing this a long time, so. Uh, what position were you in football? I played a uh, um, fullback, nose guard, um, linebacker. So yeah. Primarily, I was a defensive nose guard. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, short now. Didn't you uh, squat a thousand at 19 years old or something? Yeah, I remember that. That was one of the big goals that I wanted. Uh, I believe that at the time the youngest person to squat a thousand was a guy named Scott Weech, mm -hmm. and uh, he was 20 years old in three months. And don't ask me how I know that, but I found that out. So I, my goal, one of the goals that came here, was to be the youngest person to squat a thousand. So I ended up doing it when I was 19. I did it? I think I did it in August of. 2007 maybe mm -hmm. I was 19 and I was getting ready and I turned 20 in December so yeah that was like the last meet I could do it at I knew mm -hmm. that's when I was successful at. so Dave do you feel a lot of pressure being the poster boy of Westside when people think Westside they see Louie and you do I feel pressured no and um, it's because of probably like, like I told you before I've, I've been here so I, I was 14 years old when I got here so I was in here around a lot of uh, rough guys. A lot of them, they either they either were ex-convicts, they either just got out of prison, they either worked at the prison, or they were just a big, rough, tough dude. So, I was in here. I was a, I was a kid in here, thrown in here with a bunch of men, and I had more pressure on me every day because back then, like, if you were, you couldn't be later, they threw you out. You couldn't you couldn't miss workouts, or they threw you out. Um, if you did poor at meets, they threw you out. So, like, to me right now, it's just having fun. There was never, I never actually ever felt pressure uh, mm -hmm. because that's kind of something that comes along with training at Westside. Their pressure doesn't really mean anything. And you've adapted here. to that, right? That's just kind of how it is. Is it more relaxed now then with people getting here on time and stuff like that? I can attribute it to like as Louis gotten older, um, he doesn't really, I'll say it more like this. There's more options today. There's like, there's gyms everywhere down the road and and I think as Louis gotten older, he can't necessarily be so rough on people, like kick mm -hmm. them out because they're five minutes later, lock the door. Or sometimes, sometimes if you if you if you like basically call it paying your dues, if you if you paid your dues to the gym and you were late, you you most times they wouldn't let you work out like if you were late. But if you had paid your dues and you were basically a member, you you had to start with whatever whatever was on the bar. Mm -hmm. So if you walked in, there was two plates on the bar. That's what you started with, and you just didn't work out. Yeah. Do you feel the re-emergence of the WPO will have the desired effect of pushing the quip lifting back to the forefront of people's minds? Yeah, uh, I 100% do because I was around during the WPO, so I saw it. You know what I mean? I got to, I got to witness a lot of the peop pe people, people, people that a lot of people look up to today competed in the WPO. Like Ed Cohen competed in the WPO, and um, everybody, you know, I'm a big fan of Ed Cohen. I respect Ed Cohen. But Ed Cohen jumped, to, everybody wanted to see what Ed Cohen was going to do in the WPO, and he jumped to the WPO, and he only totaled 2460, around, around about what he totaled in single ply. So, I think with the reemergence of the WPO, it's going to give people a stage, especially all these all these big name lifters. And back then, that's what it did. It, it, it put everybody, regardless of how they lifted, whether you were a single ply lifter or a raw lifter, or even if you lifted multi ply, it was such a big stage that people didn't care they were like raw guys would back then there wasn't even raw like there you know it what raw wasn't even a thing it's like I think the raw became a thing because uh, the stage for geared lifting uh, disappeared mm -hmm. and um, after that happened it gave it didn't give people much incentive you know to spend all this money on gear and do all this other stuff and uh, um, and a lot of people gripe about multiply judging and stuff like mm -hmm. that and I think I've got around that over the years by just lifting everywhere. 
Um, but now, back then, you either lifted in the APF or, or the WPC, and that got you into the WPO. So those are my, those are the federations I like to stick to because I believe they're the most respected and they've been around the longest. Mm -hmm. The WPC, it's, it's been around, it's been around, it's the second biggest global affiliate to the IPF. I mean, I think the, I think the WPC has 48 affiliate countries and, you know, no, no one's even close to them. So, you, you know, you got to look at what's been around the longest, you know, um, and in this case, it's the WPC, which is a, which is basically the professional the WPF, the WPO is the professional branch of the WPC. I'm not sure. mm -hmm. So, with all that coming back, like I said before, I think it gives people uh, a, a stage to be on. It makes interesting matchups, like you know, Milanichev. You know, people don't, people don't, maybe they don't know, but that guy didn't start lifting raw. He was a, he might have started in his beginning days, but he was primarily a single ply lifter. He lifted in the Super Cup of the Titans out there in Russia, and uh, he'd win that all the time. He had close to a twenty, I think he had a twenty six seventy two single ply total. And then he goes raw and he can about squat the same raw. I mean, the guy looks like he got 50 pounds out of a squat suit. Then you have people like Blaine Sumner, they total 2,800 in, in single ply. And, you know, he come, in fact, if he makes a jump, somebody like him makes a jump to the WPO, that's interesting. Because uh, there's another lifter, his name's, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it, Yep Dinyarimbesh. And he's totaled 26, or I think a high 26, 2670 or 20. 2690 in single ply, and he's had, and he has a 2843 multiply total. So if you if you go by like the average, you know, single ply lifter gets 200 pounds out of gear, then you know you could say Blaine Sumner could be close to me. Mm -hmm. So it makes for interesting matchups. Um, in my opinion, I don't you know people are like what do you lift raw? Like why don't you lift raw? I don't really care about raw. You know, mm -hmm. I lift raw every day. To me, it's what multiplying gear is the true test of strength mm -hmm. because. Dude, you you either it, it's like some I'll just put it like this he you who, who he lifts the most weights when just because you lift raw that I, I didn't I didn't hold a gun to your head and tell you to lift raw you know what I mean like so do you think with this WPO competition there's going to be a lot of new talent coming through yeah like so that's what I was saying you're, I yeah. think you're, I think you're going to see a lot of a lot of uh, you're going to see a lot of people you never thought you would see mm -hmm. already they got some big raw guys on the on the uh, on the Card, list, like yeah, David yeah. Jenkinson's one, he does both. Uh -huh. uh, you got Crystal Tate and the women. Um, who else was it wrong? Janine Whitaker, she's a, she, she's like number two in her weight class. She's up at uh, Sweatshop. Yep, yep. She, she's going to do it. Um, there's a guy named Malik Durston. He's, uh, he was an 81 er that squatted like almost 800 raw. He does stuff with Dave Tate yep. on, yep. And that dude, I, 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 I've, I know him. I mean, I don't know him like, on, like the super personal, but like if I see him, we talk and say, hey. Yeah, yeah. But that's a guy, like, there's going to be dark horses like that that people aren't going to see. Mm -hmm. And then I think I, I think this year, once people see that it's actually going to be a big stage and it's going to have a lot of visually effects, it's going to look good on camera, and people, there's a little tidbit, there's going to be a spinoff documentary of the WPO. Um, the same guy that made the West Side film, is, that's the next project. So we're going to start filming that in November, so it's going to have a documentary like this West Side documentary backing the federation yeah so it's that'd gonna, be awesome there's going to be a lot of exposure it's going to be big like people think um i think the first year you're going to see a good a good presentation and i think the second year is when you're going to see a lot of the freaks roll out you can see people like milanichek you know oh sure, vlad's another one vlad squatted 1250 and multiply and went and squatted 1100 raw uh -huh. so like um he's been waxing all the raw dudes uh -huh. like, it, it almost seems like when vlad come on the scene and, and squatted that 1100 it just took the wind out of most of them raw guys yeah. Uh, now it's on, and I'll say another thing about raw. Raw lifting is hard, and it's hard on your body. And a lot of these guys they don't last long. I attribute. I, I see people like Eric Lillybridge. That's a testament to his smart training. How long he's lasted at the weights he's lifting, and um, you just kind of see these guys. I mean, you know, pe people like people like Brad Lilly, Dan Green. You can look look back five years ago and look at everybody who you looked up to raw and where are they now? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, but I'm still here. All of these still be big multiply lifters have been around. A lot of these guys you still see competing today. Been doing it 20, 25 years. So. Do you ever get annoyed when less favorable video angles get posted of your lifts, and yet the ones that clearly show you in depth, for example, get ignored? No, because because I don't see is what people I don't think understand is I don't care. I, I truly don't give a shit. Like, um, I don't, I don't, I don't go do powerlifting meets to get to get to get approval from people on the internet. You know what I mean? 
like my approval comes like first of all I'm my own worst critic there's not one person that on the internet that's looking that's gonna judge me harder than me and then it's, so you know like I said I've I've been doing this so long it's I I seek the approval of you know my training partners my coaches and my family and my friends you know those are the only people I've ever looked to um, I don't I, I mean yeah. And there was no social media back then, so well, that's what I'm saying. Like back yeah. when I, you know, even back then, it was YouTube. That was pretty much it. Yeah. But I say it like this: opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. Some yeah. think, some don't. So it doesn't. So do you think social media has kind of I helped the sport no, at all, no, or no, no, no. destroyed I think, it? I, I, both. I, I mm -hmm. see. I think um, it's made a lot of bitches, like a lot of bitch assnesses on the internet. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that'll run their mouth off. And then you'll check them in person, and they then they want to be all upset because you checked them or punked them over their fucking opinion that wasn't asked. We so can just, name one. <laughs> it's like just because somebody is on the internet, and that, just because you post something doesn't mean you have to put your opinion. Yeah. You, you know, maybe you should read in the post. Please, if somebody, please give your opinion. You know, maybe then you should give your opinion. But like. You giving your opinion isn't a gonna make me do anything you think I should do because I'm not here for mm -hmm. you or for whoever. I'm and no here. one's outlifting you, so. But it, <laughs> I mean, it's like this, and then some people say, "Well, who's Hoff competing against?" It's I have soup. There is nobody to compete against. You can even say me. I compete against the record book, which to me is is a whole on a whole other level of competition. I look at a book and have to compete against Father Time. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I I have record. I'm competing against the book that. That's that's there. I don't I don't need people. I don't I don't need that kind of motivation. Yeah. You know, it's like because there was nobody. At some times I had to I had to figure out other ways to keep myself mentally. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Focused. Yeah, that's a good word. What's your favorite pre-comp meal? Oh. Kind of depends on where I'm at. Uh, so like uh, Chicago for okay, you. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, if you go to Chicago, I like I, I, I'm kind of like a doing a win in Rome. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So if I'm if I'm close to a coast, I like do seafood, um, um, but I would say primarily probably steak. I mm -hmm. always like to find the biggest steak I can find from the best steakhouse I can find. I usually go, there. go like Fogo de Chao. Yeah. When you were out in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. I went. I got a lot of. So I got some deep dish pizza out there. I did. Yeah. Um, then you know I go down to South Carolina or Florida. That's where the WPO is this year. I'll probably look for some seafood down there. But crab mm -hmm. legs, I'm a crab legs, lobster kind of guy. How do you use diet to combat fatigue? Um, I people have asked me this before. I think a lot of it comes down. Okay, obviously what you eat is your fuel, and we're not like bodybuilders. We're not really looking to be aesthetically pleasing in some sense mm -hmm. but some pe everybody would like to be aesthetically pleasing mm -hmm. but in the long and the short of it what's your end goal and sometimes your end goal doesn't inquire include i should say being aesthetically pleasing so like primarily me as i i i live on carbs i, I eat a shitload of carbs and pr carbs fats and proteins you know I, I, those mm -hmm. are the big things that i'm on um, um mostly my carb eats I eat lots of white rice, eat lots of fried rice, white and brown rice, I rotate them, um, a lot of pasta. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty much like an off-season bodybuilder when I'm eating clean, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, there's some times when I can't be too big, because if I get too big, my gear don't fit, so there's some, yeah. sometimes there's windows I have to be in, so there's certain, it kind of depends. So, um, right now, I'm, I'm, I've lately, I've been over 300 pounds, so I'm not, you know, I'm just basically eating everything in sight. Mm -hmm. So you could say to, bat, to combat fatigue it's almost like what you eat the night before mm -hmm. sometimes it's just eating a lot of people they don't eat before they work out you know what I mean sometimes you have I mean I do that mm -hmm. I eat before I work out I think a lot of people they rely on uh, things like uh, pre-workouts and things to get them amped up mm -hmm. they just need to go eat some food you know? yeah um, who's your biggest inspiration growing up inspiration just in general mm-hmm Let's take Louis as a given since you, you came well, here when you were young. I mean, even as a kid, like just growing up in general, I would say it's probably a tie between two people. I'll say the first one's probably Hulk Hogan. Okay. Dude, so I loved wrestling growing up. You know, you say your prayers, you eat your vitamins, you know, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so I was always a huge fan of Hulk Hogan. So, mm -hmm. you know, he was a big hulking man. So I always wanted to be big like and strong like Hulk yeah, Hogan. Yeah. And then, you know, after that, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, everybody loves Arnold. Mm -hmm. you know, he was in the movies and he was the Terminator. and. 
Did you get to meet him? Um, I've been really close to him. I've never actually, you know, touched, shook hands with him, but I've been as close to meeting you to him. Like, mm -hmm. um, I've been to some, at the Arnold and stuff. He's been walking through crowds. Yeah, yeah. close to him. But, no, I've never had the opportunity to actually meet him. Yet, mm -hmm. Safety bar or cambered bar? What's your favorite and why? Well, How are those two? I would say I don't really have a favorite. I, I, I squat. I use a giant cambered bar. Okay, it's more like this. Like I use them both. I hardly ever squat with a straight bar. Mm -hmm. um, secret, that was secret for um, I usually squat with either of those two bars. So I either squat with a safety squat bar, and that's usually at the beginning of the training. It's like when I'm trying to get in shape, but it's hard. And um, primarily, I squat with a giant cambered bar. Any reason why you prefer the? Well, the, yeah. well, honestly, because if the, the, the safety squat bar that we have in here is like one of the first safety squat bars ever made. And it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. It hasn't do. got handles, right? It, it doesn't have handles. Well, that's the thing. It never was supposed to have handles. You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. everyone holds handles. Like, we never, I wasn't allowed to do that here. If you, if you went and touched the handle, they immediately rack it, kick you off, and make you redo it. Like, they would they, they, they would stop everything. Yeah. That didn't count. You know, you, just because you touched, like, uh -huh. touched the bar. So, I was always brought up you weren't allowed to touch the bar. Uh -huh. But, uh, safety squat bar, that's... It's good for getting in shape. It's just hard. It's mm -hmm. it's just people don't like to use it. If you use the one here, you'll hate it. So I mm -hmm. hate it. I don't like the safety squat bar because it's hard, but I use it to yeah. extra. Um, what about bands and chains? Do you have a preference? Um, I, it uh, it kind of depends on where I'm at in the training cycle. Um, with me, I tend to steer away from bands a lot, especially when I'm getting, taking a heavy bench press. Mm -hmm. uh, when I start getting... When I start using a lot of bands in the squat or straight bar, it'll impinge my shoulders, and then and then you go and do a thousand pound board presses or whatever, and that wastes everything. So, and then I got nothing for the next week. So, yeah, typically, yeah. Um, like I, m most times when I'm looking to be getting in shape to going into a meet, I use bands. You know, in the later half, and I'll move over to chains. Yeah. yeah. Last time, this last meet I did uh, the thirty fourteen. I did a lot of bands this time just because I had been away from it so long. Lou's like, hey, you could. We should do bands, blah, 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 and I was like, whatever, so I just listened to the old band. Uh, do you ever utilize pause deadlifts in your training, or any other isometrics, and how do you feel about them? Pause deadlifts? Like, uh, you mean starting from a dead stop and it's like, like a rack pull or something? No, like, um, stopping midway, pausing. Um, I, that's not something I ever do, mm -hmm. really. Um, I think that's more so if... if if you have a weakness that that needs catered to, and that exercise is what caters to your weakness, mm -hmm. and that's something you should do. Me personally, um, we don't really pause. We we're, we're kind of like the opposite. We preach speed. So um, uh, bench presses. I don't really, you know, I, I'll pause on boards. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'll, I do a chain squat. Call it a progressive chain squat workout. You might have seen videos of it. Um, but I'll set like chains up in a monolith, and I'll have a uh, chain height set with tape. Mm -hmm. So I have like a I have a breaking parallel chain, a two, a four, and a six inch chain, and I have carabiners that hook on those chains. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll go down and I'll take I'll get in full gear, and then I'll, I'll pause on those chains and do stuff like yeah. that. But um, but as but for the most part, me not really. I think. Uh, <laughs> Stuff like static holds, you know, belt squat holds, I do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if a lifter is shaking on the bench press, usually do, during the unrack, what are they doing wrong, particularly if this isn't normal for them? Overtraining? Yeah. Frying. That's the first thing I say. If I hand somebody a bench press and they start shaking and I hear plates, I'll pull it in the rack and tell them to come home and don't come back for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Because when you when you start shaking like, like you, and you hear plates rattling, that means your central nervous system is pretty much, you're, you're approaching the door of frying your central nervous system. Mm -hmm. uh, once you fry your central nervous system, it takes you three to five weeks just to get back to dead even normal. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand it. Some people might disagree with me. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen it a lot enough to know that yeah. that's what happens. So once you fry your central nervous system, you, you could you could you could lose you could lose two two and a half months of a whole training just by frying your central nervous system trying to come back from it. You get what I'm saying? So like to me that's a sign. When I see people shaking that I you've done too much, go home. Rest. Yeah. So that that would sum it up there mm -hmm. and then after they quit shaking then I could probably 
Yeah. Usually, you know, a shaking is a weak upper back or weak lats. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they can't support the weight under them. One of the girls here once showed you a video of my bench, and you said I needed more upper back work. How does the upper back get used in the bench, and what's this rolling getting the bar from chest to lockout? Okay, first part of your question, what does, um, what you say? What does what do for the, the um, how does the upper back get used in the bench? Oh, it's a lot of like when, you, when you're coming to lock weight out and the, when, the bar, when the bar is shifting towards you, your upper back is like what's pushing away. Mm -hmm. And that's what holds your arch in place and what keeps your chest up. So when you're pinching your lats and shit together um, and you come down on a bench and you know, most people, have anybody ever flattened out on a bench or they have problems flattened out on a bench or they can't hold an arch, you got a weak upper back mm -hmm. um, because those are things... Uh, that holds your arches, like your, your upper back and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and the second part is, well, yeah, what's this role from getting the bar from the chest to lockout? Is it just... Say it one more time. Getting the bar from the chest to lockout. Is it just to like maintain, so it's just to maintain the position of the arch, is it? Or does it kind of help it come off the chest or anything? Um, it's almost, if, if, I, I, if you ever know, if you ever seen a leaf spring in the suspension of a vehicle, a truck, it's like a spring. Okay. So imagine like a leaf spring. I try to like imagine myself like an arch. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if your leaf spring's cocked like this and, and, and the weight hits it, you're going to have more of a of a bounce. But if you're flatter and not as tighter, mm -hmm. or, I, I'm kind of butchering it. But um, yeah, I believe it. It it kind of it kind of gives you leverage. It lever it gives you leverage under the bar. Mm -hmm. It increases your leverage when you when you arch yeah. the bar and opposed to rolling it down. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're asking. The last few meets you haven't benched over a thousand pounds. Is there a shoulder issue you've been nursing or are they fatigued from squatting beforehand or are you now more focused on playing safely on the bench to build your total? Um, well, this last, okay, it's, a, it's, well, okay, I'll just start the beginning. A lot of it was as I took a year, I took about a year and a half off from training. Um, my dad was real sick and I was having a lot of injuries. My, my leg didn't work, I had nerve damage in my hip, mm -hmm. I had bad sciatic issues. And I literally had to walk, I had to step away for a year and a half, so um, in doing that, I kind of just, it wasn't really training, I was messing around, so mm -hmm. I was messing around and benching 900 pounds. Probably shouldn't have been, well, through that, I started gaining weight, and the shirts I, most of all, I've had about five bench press shirts that I rotate through, through these past, yeah. I'll say from about 2011, and here it is 2018, you know, for the past, these, I've got seven years of wear on these five bench press shirts. So long story short, they started splitting and then I'd get them fixed and I would gain weight and they would get more stiff and rigid and I couldn't touch nothing. So I'd go to another shirt, you know, and me being bigger in these shirts, I'd start splitting seams in these older shirts. So long story short, I, I, was, I went through a stream of blowing shirts mm -hmm. and I got to the point where I'd blown every shirt and I was just getting shirts and trying to put them on. And um, so finally this past me, um, the last one I did here, the one I totaled 3014, I passed on, a, I passed on my third bench. I did that primarily because of where I was at. Um, when you go to the APF Nationals, the APF is one of the hardest federations here in America to live in. And uh, the fact that when I got that 1223 squat, I was like, all right, I just need these two benches to total 3,000 and that's all I need. Uh -huh. So you, you, can, you can get into a meet and once I'm presented with the biggest total of all time, I'm just going to take that. You know what I mean? Like benching mm -hmm. a thousand at that time was di didn't become a priority to me. Um, so I benched the 975. It felt like a solid, easy bench press. I mm -hmm. think I could have maybe benched a thousand eight after that, but so you didn't need to. Yeah, I just. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of. It's it was. It's basically. I'll sum it up as a mixture of bench pressing, getting bench press shirts right, blowing shirts out, trying mm -hmm. to get the right one. Because I don't care who you are, a thousand pound benches. You need you need you need custom shirts. They gotta fit you perfect. They're gonna fit you like you love. Yeah. And you know I, I, I you know normally these past couple of years I've been a, I've been a light you know two two eighty two eighty five and then I gained another 15, 20 pounds. So I've been over three hundred pounds trying to use shirts on this you know two seventy five body weight. So now I got new shirts and now I'm working through these ones. Yeah. So I think give me give me a year and you'll see a ten fifty bench. What's going through your head when you take a thousand pounds um, out from a rack or off the floor? What kind of place do you go to? Um, I'm just there. It, it, okay, I'll sum it up. Like I don't go to any place. I mm -hmm. just come there. That's where I'm at. And a lot of people, I think they, they make the mistake of going to a place when they need to be right there. Mm -hmm. So I, to me, it's more like 
you're living in the second as each as I'm living in each second as it's going by. It's mm -hmm. no way to describe it. I'm not. I'm aware of nothing around me. I can hear. I can hear my guy telling me how close I am and stuff like that. But like when they're handing it to me, I don't. I don't. It, it feel. People ask me what that feels like, and um, at the, when I first started getting them, it was a crushing feeling. Now, now it just feels like bench presses. Mm -hmm. They don't. People. I say, what's your what's your best bench? Mine. Yeah. Uh, in kilos, I've uh, done 115. So what's that? Uh, 240 Two, something. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, 245, 250 feels like 450 to me. Uh huh. It, it's re it's all relative. So like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm just in the moment. Mm -hmm. That's where you got to be. You're, you you got to have everything right there and then, and yeah. that's kind of like. I think a lot of people miss that. And the final question. Uh, did you even see Louis before you pushed him? <laughs> uh, no. That's funny. No, I didn't. Well, what happened was, okay, so there's been a lot of history behind me and Louis like that. Um, I think I'll never forget there was one time when Louis, um, it was when AJ was still here. Okay. I had just totaled 29.10 and AJ totaled 28.55 and we, we had these big ass totals, but there was still a man named Jonas Ranson in from Finland. Uh -huh. And uh, so we did this in August, and then September, October rolls around, and Jonas goes to this bull farm meet, squats the biggest squat of all time, 1267, and he ends up totaling 2954. So he out totals me by 40 pounds, out totals, beats AJ's world record total by 100 pounds. And uh, I'll never forget, like, Lou, Lou walked in the gym the next day and he was he was fucking pissed. He walked up to me and there's been a few times when I've not when I when something when records get taken from West Side, Louis gets pissed. So that Yotis beat AJ and he beat him good and he beat me at the same time. And uh, that pissed Lou off and he came up, he grabbed him on my shirt, and he got in my face and said, I he said, You need to go three oh eight and get that fucking record back and then threw me back, turned around and walked away. So so in August, I totaled 2910, which was a 100 pound PR total. So my best total at the time that year, March, I totaled 2805, and I came into August and totaled 2910. So I put 100 pound, 105 pounds on my total, and here's Lou telling me to put another 60 on it in three months. So, well, so the whole point I'm getting to is me and over the year, Louis built me and him built animosity. He he always has a way of fucking like trying to punch at me. So. People don't see the punches and the jabs and, and some, sometimes pressure. You know, there's different. There's, there, there, mm -hmm. there's not to say there's not pressure. There is, but um, that's the kind of pressure I get put on me. Um, so in that, um, there was a time. So the whole point I'm getting to is, so it was actually at that meet. I was the first meet I squatted 1,200 at. So I was the first 1,200 pound squat at Westside, and um, I ended up benching 965. 960 mm -hmm. or something like that. My best bench at the time was 940, 45, and I pulled 800 and I totaled 2960. That beat that beat Jonas by like five pounds or something like that. And I remember Louie had walked over and I looked at him and I came over and I picked him up and I headbutted him in the head and split his head and they got the same seven stitches in his forehead. It's like people will get all mad. Like why do I throw people? It's like this. I'm in such a case. Okay, so like there is a place that that in the moment, in the now, in the second requires adrenaline. All right, that's all I can say. Mm -hmm. I get I, I get such a dump of adrenaline that uh, I don't really see anything. It's just to whoever's me, it in seems your like way. A flash. Just, I'm, I'm screaming. I, I don't even really hear what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so fast forward to now, you know, Louis knows better. That's mm -hmm. what people don't understand. Yeah. Louis fucking knows better. He people know better. Like don't walk up on me after that. Mm -hmm. So long story short. I pulled that deadlift and I was pushing people all the way and I started to come around and to me I, I went like this and I saw Louie coming towards me. So in my mind I thought he was going to come and like push me, you know what I mean? So like I, I don't, man I've been hit by people like Chuck, so I remember when there was one time Chuck Chuck didn't deadlift for a year and went to meet and pulled 820 uh -huh. and he comes off screaming and doing this and he comes up to me and, and, and hits me and I didn't hit back and it, and it hurt like uh -huh. really bad, it was like I hit a wall of granite. So like for, there was times here right where, where I was just conditioned if somebody walks up on you, yeah, yeah, you give them some. So that's why I thought he wanted. So I was apparently gave him a little too much. <laughs> Dave Hoff, Small World Lifters. Where can people find you? Um, you can you can find me at, on Instagram, uh, Mister Dot Three K Fourteen, or Dave Hoff. Just search on Instagram. Um, I'm on Facebook, David Hoff, and. That's probably the best places right there. All right. Peace out.